Hi, good evening, and welcome to the Emily Dickinson Museum on a scorching July afternoon. Uh, my name is Jane Wald. I'm the executive director of the Emily Dickinson Museum, and I want to welcome you to uh, the second in a three-part series uh, going behind the scenes of the Emily Dickinson Museum's collections uh, cataloging project. Uh, in part one, in April, we spoke with Nan Wolverton, who uh, was the author of the museum's furnishings plan, which is one of the drivers of this collections project, uh, a plan that uh, discusses how we should arrange uh, artifacts and objects throughout the two houses, the Homestead and the Evergreen, so we can tell the best stories about Emily Dickinson and her family. Now, that was completed back in 2007. We talked about the goals of that plan and a few of the objects that make the two houses so very evocative of the Dickinson family's lives. And tonight we'll focus on a particular category of the thousands of objects in our collection. Uh, and this will be works on paper. Uh, to lead us through a discussion of the surprises and challenges of taking care of paper-based collections objects, uh, I'll be joined by Megan Ramsey the museum's collections manager. And uh, <clears throat> just today, Megan has completed cataloging the last few items in this three-year project. And um, I'll let her share a number with you. Um, uh, then after, <clears throat> after uh, Megan joins us, we'll uh, also be joined by Carolyn Frieza, who's head conservator of Works on Paper, a firm that specializes in the conservation of art uh, and archival materials. Uh, Carolyn has been conserving works on paper for uh, more than 20 years and has been an invaluable resource for the Emily Dickinson Museum during this uh, massive project. At the end of our program, there'll be an opportunity to ask questions of any of us. So we encourage you to place your questions into the typed Q&A feature of the Zoom program, and you can find that uh, in your toolbar, usually at the bottom of your screen. Uh, well, the case is for the homestead and the evergreens that there are really remarkably few paper-based objects in the museum's collection. So if we say that the museum's collection is roughly uh, eight or 9,000 objects, and um, I see Megan kind of smiling about that, um, it may be that roughly 1,500 of these items uh, are paper-based. And of these, very few really are handwritten or printed manuscripts. Uh, and there are sort of three events that are, are the reason for this, uh, for this sort of lopsided nature of the, um, of the home museum's collection. Um, and the first was, um, uh, Martha Dickinson Bianchi's transfer of her family's papers from the homestead to the Evergreens prior to her sale of the homestead in 1916. So uh, Martha was Emily's niece uh, by 1916. There were no other living uh, members of her family uh, from uh, in, in Emily Dickinson's sort of immediate family. Um, well, these papers included family books and journals and correspondence and the majority of her Aunt Emily's poem manuscripts. Uh, fast forward about 35 years, uh, the second event was Alfred and Mary Hampson's transfer in 1950 to Harvard University of a portion of the family uh, literary, uh, the uh, family library. Um, Dickinson poem man manuscripts, portions of family correspondence and papers related to the publication of Emily Dickinson's poetry through the 1940s. And just as a reminder, Alfred and Mary Hampson were Martha Dickinson Bianchi's heirs. And the third event was Mary Hampson's provision in her estate plans to leave all the remaining books and manuscripts to Brown University uh, in Rhode Island, where she believed they would be well cared for. So today, the three principal repositories where Dickinson family manuscripts, books, and other <clears throat> printed materials can be found are uh, first at the Special Collections at the Houghton Library at Harvard University, 
Uh, second, special collections at the John Hay Library at Brown University. Uh, and third, uh, special collections at the Robert Frost Library at Amherst College. Um, and those manuscripts, those Dickinson manuscripts at Amherst College uh, are, are those items retained by Mabel Loomis Todd after her editorial activities came to an end. And of course, all Emily Dickinson's extant poems are available for viewing um, and for comparing manuscript versions uh, and different published versions uh, on edickinson.org. So Megan, can you bring us, to, bring us down to cases? Um, so over the course of the last three years, the museum has uh, undertaken this huge collections project uh, with funding from the Institute for Museum and Library Services. We've worked to create a catalog of our entire collection for the first time ever. Um, so this is a you know ginormous project. Um, and this has included going through hundreds of boxes and digging in all of the closets and nooks and crannies of both the homestead and the evergreens and recording every object that we find, photographing it, and adding it to a database. Um, so just today, uh, me and the collections assistant, Caitlin McGrath, we finished the final, cataloging the final project, or the final object for this project, um, and that brings us to the total of 8,274 objects. Um, so there's still some more work to do, but at least for this project, um, we have over 8,000 8, objects in the collection, which is really exciting. Um, so this catalog that we're creating is really um, including only skeletal information just so we can identify the object and locate it again, but it really creates, um, you know, a lot of groundwork for future projects, especially a lot of research projects, since we don't always know the history and context of our objects uh, within the Dickinson houses. Um, so our collection includes everything that you might find in a home. We have everything from furniture to window coverings. We have perfume bottles. We have pots and pans. We have parasols. Um, everything that you can think of in your own house that we have um, some Dickinson pieces that are um, related to that. Um, so the collections team that's been working on this project has been myself, the collections assistant, Caitlin McGrath, and we've had nine student interns over the last three years. Um, and then in addition to the staff at the museum, we've also brought on um, experts that specialize in different areas of collections care to come in and help us think about um, the ways that we should be preserving this collection for the future. So um, all of our collections objects are at risk of further deterioration from changes in temperature and humidity and um, pest damage and exposure to light. Um, but some objects are more sensitive to others and that includes paper-based objects. And that's where Carolyn comes in. So Carolyn, can you tell us more about conservation? Yes. So I wanted to start off with a brief overview about the field of conservation. Um, the, conser the, the field of conservation, the word is defined by the American Institute of Conservation, which is our professional organization, as the profession devoted to the preservation of cultural property for the future. So the term cultural property is, is a big wide term and that describes a wide variety of material culture, including objects, collections, specimens, structures and buildings, or other sites that have been identified as having artistic, historic, scientific, religious, or social significance. And so tonight we're gonna focus on the conservation and preservation of works on paper at, in the Emily Dickinson Museum's collection. So to touch on um, some common threats to paper collections, I've, I've put together a series of six images. Um, these are all objects in the museum collection. Each, each one has its own condition issues. Um, some of them are due to the, the nature of the materials themselves. Some of them are due to storage and use. Um, and we'll get into some specific, specifics of those in a little bit. But again, back to sort of what, what, is, what is conservation and what does a conservator do? Um, because cultural property is made up of so many different kinds of materials, conservators specialize in the preservation of specific types of objects. For example, I'm a paper conservator, so I treat a wide variety of paper-based objects that might include prints, drawings, watercolors, documents, maps, photographs, uh, wallpaper, 
which we've also been working on at the museum, and three-dimensional objects such as globes and hat boxes. Like all types of cultural property, paper-based collections are threatened by exposure to a variety of factors, and Megan just mentioned some of these, and they include excessive light, temperature and humidity extremes, pests, pollutants, poor handling, display, and storage practices, natural disasters, and things like burst pipes, and other types of accidental damage. All of the objects shown on the screen above, as I said, are from the museum collection and show different types of damage that typically develop in paper-based objects. Trained conservators can help prevent and mitigate damage to these objects by documenting, analyzing, treating, and housing or framing these collections. This work ensures that these cultural resources are given the best possible care and remain available for the education, scholarship, advancement, and enrichment of future generations. So there are six primary activities that conservators typically take part in. Um, the first two I kind of put together um, and they are examination and documentation. These are both important aspects of the AIC Code of Ethics. Again, that's the American Institute of Conservation. And these are activities that may distinguish a professional conservator from an amateur. Based on the examination of an object, a conservator will provide a written condition assessment, which would include types of materials used in the object and any known identifying information, such as the name of the author or artist and the title of the work. We also will include a step-by-step -step treatment proposal for that object. And these records, and we also include photographic documentation, and we keep these as permanent records and provide them to the client as well. So treatment, a lot of what conservators do, depending on what their personal preferences are, um, does involve the physical treatment of the real object. Um, that's that's really my, my personal favorite. I, I really like working with the objects at the bench, um, but I do other things too. So our objective when we're treating an object is to make sure that we've selected treatment that is suitable to the preservation of the aesthetic, conceptual, and physical characteristics of that object. Interventions during the course of treatment should be reversible whenever possible. Of course, there are some cases where we can't make things reversible, such as removing old harmful repairs from the historic document, which is shown in the upper right corner. Prior to treating an object, the conservator will consider its historical context. For example, does the staining or discoloration of the materials offer evidence of use? Does this use hold historical value? We will talk about some of these considerations later on using some examples from the Dickinson Museum collection. So another activity that we spend a lot of time with is preventive care. And that's really how we would categorize this, this big grant funded project um, of having servers come in and work with the collections and curatorial staff. We are, we are coming up with a preventive care plan for all aspects of this collection. So that will include um, minimizing the effects of deterioration and or damage to the cultural objects. Um, you know, one conservator can care for many more objects by establishing and recommending good preventive care guidelines. Than, than I could by just treating objects individually in my studio. So we, we try to balance out um, the work that we do in terms of physical treatment of objects and looking at the bigger picture and providing preventive care guidelines for collections. Um, so again, as, as Megan mentioned, um, this particular big multi-year IMLS grant funded project allowed myself an object conservator and a textile conservator to come in and really take an in-depth look at a good cross-section of this, this large collection, um, both at the storage facility, looking at both museum sites and talking with collections care and curatorial staff. And the goal of this project from our part of it is to provide some written guidelines and suggestions for the future care and preservation of this collection. Another part of our tasks that we must do as conservators is research. Um, that can vary depending on the scope of the project that we're working on, but we do conduct different types of research on a routine basis. So this would include things like in-depth examination and testing of the materials that are used in an object. We might perform research into different treatment techniques or materials, you know, trying out different adhesives to work for a specific project, and also conducting scientific studies, such as determining the aging properties of a specific adhesive. Um, the example in the center there, it doesn't come through as well as I'd hoped 
on the screen, but that's looking at a watercolor sketch of a bird in transmitted light. And what you can see is the watermark in the paper, which reads J. Watman, 1830. So that's a good example of how doing a little bit more in-depth research can tell us a lot more about the time period in which the object was created. So the sixth task that we like to, to include in our route is um, education. So conservation education includes promoting public awareness of the field, and it can also include activities such as training conservators and staff or volunteers at cultural institutions. This can be through workshops on a specific task, such as how to safely vacuum mold from a collection of historic books, which is what's going on in the lower right there, or a public presentation such as this one. So now we're gonna move on to looking at some specific examples from the museum's collection. Great, that was an awesome overview, Carolyn, thank you. Um, so the first object we're gonna look at tonight is a band box. Um, and band box is kind of a catch-all term for a decorative box. It's usually constructed out of pasteboard, which is just layers of paper together. Um, and it usually has wallpaper on the outside, which is durable for when you travel. And also it looks nice. Um, and so you can think of like hat boxes. That's like the, the typical thing when people see these. Um, this one here is a Dickinson family piece, uh, and it has been attributed to Emily Norcross Dickinson, the poet's mother. Uh, it was previously on display in the homestead parlors before the restoration. Um, but since last year, when we reopened after our restoration, um, it's now on display in the passage on the second floor in between the poet's bedroom and her mother's. So, uh, I don't so I'm going, so I'm going to jump in and talk a little bit about this specific object from the conservation standpoint. Um, so this particular band box in the museum's, museum's collection shows damage that is pretty common to this type of functional three-dimensional object. As you can see in the images, the box appears somewhat indented on the top and has left a small section of the band around its lid. The board layers that make up the box um, are also delaminating, delaminating, which means the layers are separating from each other. And some of the wallpaper also appears to be loose and somewhat worn. So it's very likely that some of this wear occurred during the band boxes useful life when it was really used as an object to transport materials by carriage when the family was traveling. But some of it, most, most likely the, the slight crushing of the top of the box, was probably caused when this box was put away in a closet, possibly forgotten about by the family, and other heavy items were placed on top of it. So I want to show another example of a band box. This one is not in the Emily Dickinson Museum's collection. This is an object that I treated a number of years ago for the Weston Vermont Historical Society. But you can see here on the left in the before treatment photograph that it has pretty similar condition issues and damage. Um, a little bit worse. Um, I think this one really had some very heavy boxes placed on top of it once it did kind of get pushed back to the back of the closet. Um, so it has a much more severely warped lid and a large section of the lip had fallen off. It also had some delamination of the board layers. This is pretty common, the sim similar type of wear. So in this particular case, um, I did write a condition report and perform a number of treatment steps. The goal of treatment was to physically stabilize the object and, and get it ready for display. So this band box, the first step after doing that documentation and photography was to conduct dry surface cleaning uh, to remove soil from the wallpaper. This particular box also had printed newspaper folios adhered to the inside. Um, many of them do, and that can be a really interesting way to date them um, in terms of when they were made. So this one, we cleaned the inside and the outside of the box using dry techniques. We don't want to get this wet. Um, and then the next step was to go through and re-adhere all those separating layers of paper and board. And we typically use in paper conservation an adhesive, which is wheat starch paste. Um, it's reversible in water. Uh, it, it has really good aging properties. It's not gonna turn yellow. It's not gonna cause acidic damage. So that's really, you'll, you'll hear me mention wheat starch paste again and again. Um, 
So we did some stabilization of those separating layers. And then the next step, because the lid was so dented, um, we wanted to be able to get that more in plane and flat again so that it could rest more securely on the top of the box. But before we could do that, um, I had to remove that lip around the edge of the lid. Before I could remove it, I had to really closely document all those little sewing structures and the pattern of the sewing thread um, that attaches the lip to the top of the lid because I wanted to know exactly how to put it back um, once I did get them flat and repaired and ready to go back together. I didn't want to be making up a different sewing stitch pattern. I really wanted to follow the original plan for this particular sewing. So once that was documented, I removed the threads, gently humidified and flattened the lid under pressure for several weeks, probably a couple of months, and then it was ready to rejoin with the sewing, which was fun. So some of these projects, the three-dimensional ones, we sort of have to work a little bit outside of our regular wheelhouse and work in, in three dimension instead of two. So I, I always enjoy these three-dimensional projects. Um, so this next piece, um, is a hand colored paper certificate that's actually attached to and then rolled into a fabric casing. So that picture on, on the right side of the screen in the, the upper part with the grid background, uh, that's how we found this object in a box. And then we found that we had to completely unroll it. And then the picture on the, the very left, um, is it fully extended? Um, all of the words on there are either in Russian or a Slavic decorative script. Uh, so Google Translate has not been super helpful. <laughs> um, but we did have a little bit of transcription or translation help with this piece. Um, and we found that it is attributed to Martha Dickinson Bianchi, which is uh, Emily Dickinson's niece. She actually married a Russian soldier in 1902. So that's how she got the Bianchi name. Um, and we do know that it's dated to October 9th, 1905. Um, and we believe that it's from a Slavic auxiliary society in Moscow. Yeah, this piece is really uh, interesting, partly because uh, we, don't, we don't yet have a full picture of Martha Dickinson Bianchi's uh, introduction to uh, Russian language and culture and how that interest developed. Uh, she herself wrote a, wrote a personal memoir um, of her life up that, that went up until about uh, 1895 or 1900. And that doesn't have much to say about her interest in Russian language and culture. But we know that she was a, a gifted linguist and um, at some point became fluent in Russian. And as Megan mentioned her, she was married to a, a, a Russian cavalry officer, Captain Alexander Bianchi, but that marriage lasted only about six years before he returned to Europe permanently. Um, there still exist in the uh, Brown University uh, special collection, some handwritten letters between the two written in Russian, um, uh, along with a group of photographs of um, Russian military cavalry units, which look like they could be Cossack units. Uh, she and Martha also has a, she has this really interesting brass sculpture um, that is a, a, a Cossack soldier on horseback kind of swooping down to pick up his, his hat or some object from, from the ground. So um, certainly she, she had a lot of interest in, um, in Russian uh, culture. Um, and this scroll is really interesting uh, because of the date. Um, it's the same year as the Russian Revolution of 1905 when soldiers of the Imperial Guard um, and remember her husband, Bianchi, Captain Bianchi, he was in the Imperial Horse Guard. In any case, um, soldiers of the Imperial Guard fired on a crowd um, uh, that was marching toward, uh, uh, marching to present a petition to the Tsar. Um, and as I said, we don't, we don't know enough yet about uh, Martha Dickinson Bianchi's travel and movements during this period, but it sure is intriguing, isn't it? Um, she became so immersed in Russian literature and culture that she published a translation uh, uh, that was titled Russian Lyrics and Cossack Songs in 1910. 
so the bottom line here is that uh, we get to do more research into this object and uh, into Martha's connections with Russian culture. Great, so uh, now I'm gonna jump in again and talk about how paper objects such as the scroll and also objects such as Japanese decorative scrolls that we think of um, seeing them hanging on the wall, but they were actually like the scroll intended to be opened and closed on a, on a pretty routine basis. Um, the Japanese hanging scrolls were typically change seasonally. So they would hang for a couple of months and then get re-rolled back up and placed in a storage box. Um, so when, when conservators are thinking about um, the condition issues and how best to, to preserve these moving objects, um, we have to think about things like what, what's going to happen to it in, in the future? You know, is this going to go into storage and nobody's going to look at it? Is this gonna be an object that researchers are particularly interested in looking at in person? So it's going to need to be able to be safely unrolled and re-rolled. Is this something that might go on display at some point within the museum setting? These are all questions that you know conservators would talk to with, with curatorial and collections care staffs to come up with, you know, what's, what's the best approach for this particular object? Um, you can see in the two images of the scroll on the left um, that it does have quite a lot of horizontal creases. And we know, Megan and I know, because we, we unrolled it, unrolled it a couple of times um, when we were in storage, that it is, it is pretty brittle and stiff. Um, it doesn't want to open out flat. It, it has the paper, a memory has the paper, and it has spent probably most, if not all of its life, mostly rolled rolled up. Um, you can see that there are some edge tears and crumpled edges on those vertical edges there. Um, and also the way that the scroll was originally intended to be rolled, um, which was really just starting at the top and rolling it up on itself until you got down to the bottom and could wrap the cloth component over and secure it with a silk cord. That That's also causing stress to the paper, especially as it continues to age and become more stiff and brittle. Um, so again, when we're thinking about what, what, what's the best approach for preserving this scroll, we do want to think about, you know, how is it going to be used? Um, and that will really determine, you know, how much treatment is it going to get? Um, if this is an object that is likely to be used quite a bit, um, we would really want to make sure that we did our due diligence and did our very thorough conservation treatment and repaired all the tears and stabilized the weak areas and did a series of humidification and flattening treatments to help the scroll regain some of its flexibility and go a little bit more back into plane. Um, you know, this is not an object that we would necessarily recommend opening up flat and, and leaving it flat. It is, it is meant to roll. Um, but like many things, there's a good a good way, a best way, and a wrong way to do it. Um, typically for rolled objects, you can see on the right there, there's a couple different ways that conservators like to roll paper. Um, one thing that we always really like to do is to roll the paper item around a support tube so that that tube is really what's holding the paper layers together once it's rolled up, it's not crushing in on itself. And there's different ways of doing this, um, different types of tubes that we might use. It might construct different types of storage boxes. And again, this really will come down to how, what's the intended future use of this object. Um, and that lower right image there too, um, this was an object that went back to a historical society and they did anticipate unrolling it and rolling it back up um, for researchers. So one, one thing that we often do is provide really detailed guidelines and how-to instructions so that whoever is responsible for getting the object out from storage and showing it to a researcher knows exactly how to unroll it and re-roll it safely. Uh, so this next pair of objects um, are some hand-colored lithographs with views of Niagara Falls. Uh, the one on the left is Horseshoe Fall and the one on the right is the Falls of Niagara. Um, and Susan Dickinson created an inventory of the Evergreens in 1895 after Austin's death. She went room by room, wall by wall, and recorded basically everything in the house. 
And these two lithographs she recorded as hanging on the walls of the Evergreens Library. And that is still where they are displayed after 160 some odd years. Um, and uh, an interesting kind of connection is that uh, Susan and Austin actually went to Niagara Falls uh, for their honeymoon in 1856, but we don't actually know when these lithographs were purchased by the Dickinsons. Great, so um, as part of the grant funded survey project, um, Megan and Caitlin and I looked at a lot of different works of art on paper, um, many of which had been many, many years ago removed from their frames and placed into storage. And then also um, probably 20 or 25 items that were still framed and on display at the Evergreens, including these, these prints. Um, this, this particular pair of prints they are hand colored, um, which means instead of being the color being printed, it was hand applied with a brush, most likely watercolor and maybe some gouache. Um, these, these prints both exhibit pretty typical condition issues that we see in 19th century prints. Um, the papers have, have discolored overall, um, less so the one on the left. Um, it's hard to know, know why these, these, I think both came or part of a series that were printed at the same time. I can't remember the number of views, but there was a set that was printed by the publisher of different views of the Niagara Falls. Um, so it's very likely that they originally started off looking quite similar and then maybe one has had more exposure to light. So the paper has gotten darker, it's hard to know. Um, they both have what we call foxing, um, and these are these little soft, round, orange-brown stains that you'll see on all kinds of paper collections. You see them a lot, a lot of the times in old books. Um, we see them on prints, drawings, really across the board. It's sort of one of the common condition issues of paper, paper-based collections. And foxing is typically caused by interactions of components in the paper itself, or in this case, um, probably poor quality 19th century boards that would have been placed behind the prints in the frame. Um, those materials reacting with high humidity and warm temperature and causing these, these stains to develop and migrate through to the, to the prints themselves. Um, the good news is that foxing is something that paper conservators are often able to address in conservation treatment. It is a treatment step that does involve water. Um, so sort of going back to that original part about what do conservators do, the examination and documentation and research, um, we always test everything really thoroughly as part of the condition assessment. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we also test again once treatment is underway. Um, typically watercolors from this period are, are pretty stable and we have different ways of, of getting them wet that are more intense and than others. Um, so typically boxing on prints like this can be corrected through conservation treatment and the acidity in the paper can also be removed through wet treatment. Um, one, one thing that Megan and I and Caitlin and I talked about when we were looking at the framed prints is that um, oftentimes there's no information about what the materials were used for framing. And that's, that's a really important piece to know. Um, looking at the photograph in the center of the back of the frame print, we, we know these prints were framed sometime in the 20th century. Um, it's possible that the mat boards were good quality, but we really, we really don't know. It's possible that they have corrugated cardboard behind them. We can see for sure that they have acidic craft paper. Uh, we don't know what kind of glass or plexiglass is on the front. I think we did a sort of quick, quick look and concluded it probably did not have any kind of filter to help filter out the harmful UV rays. Um, so one of the things we talked about including as part of the report are some guidelines for, for when you do have an object framed, coming up with a labeling system that you put on the back of the frame so you know for sure exactly what materials were used. Um, and I just did this for another big, big project um, where you were conserving watercolors and reframing them. And, came up with a labeling system that stays with the object and also goes into the treatment report for that object. So there's a lot of record keeping on, on everybody's parts in, in, in museum collections. Uh, so we have another pair of framed uh, prints that we'll be discussing. Um, 
And so what you can see here is um, two different views of the newly restored uh, South Parlor in the homestead. Um, and we'll be talking about the two framed engravings on the walls. Um, these are, this is probably one of my favorite kind of collection success stories out of both this cataloging project and this restoration project that we just completed last year. Um, these two projects came together in order for these two prints and a third um, print that's in the North Parlor um, that they're all beautifully conserved and uh, reframed and hanging for everyone to see when they enter the homestead. Yeah, these these engravings are especially impressive in person when you're standing in the room. And um, so there were uh, three engravings by Edwin Lancier conserved during this project. Uh, one was titled The Challenge, another The Lost Sheep, and the third uh, The Deer Pass. Uh, and so I, I, um, I actually have this favorite quotation from Martha Dickinson Bianchi's own recollections that give you a sense of the importance of artwork to the family, uh, but also the place of engravings within that whole collection. And so she writes that um, Austin was so familiarly known at the New York galleries that they often telegraphed him to come down and see uh, a new treasure before it was put on public sale. When he actually did buy a painting and get it home, he sometimes kept it upstairs in the guest room with the door shut for weeks before showing it to his father, whose taste in art ran, or rather walked, to steel engravings. And who might well consider such doings of Austin extravagant, if not unduly fanciful. Of course, when he was ready, Sue and Emily were the first to peep at each one, propped up against a chair to catch the best light. A picture in itself, those three standing there, Austin and Sue flushed with excitement and Emily reveling in a new emotion of color as she gazed. So I just love this. Her grandfather's taste walked to steel engravings. Um, so Lancer must have been a favorite artist of Edward Dickinson um, because Martha also identified three other engravings at her grandfather's house, uh, the Forrester's family, the stag at bay, and Arctic night. And I used to think that, that those three titles, were, she was actually talking about these other three engravings that we've just conserved. But, but in the course of this project, um, Megan found the Forrester's family uh, that's still in the museum's collection. So I have to rethink my whole, uh, my whole theory about that. Um, but uh, they, they are really, they're really magnificent. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the conservation treatment that I performed on these prints. As, as they mentioned, there were, there were a total of three. We picked two um, to show as part of this presentation. Um, I've actually treated a number of of Edward Lancer engravings here. Um, and they often do hang in historic house museums um, and were acquired by prominent New England families. Um, so this is the lost sheep, um, kind of a dramatic image. Um, and you can see on the left, so those are the before treatment shots and on the right, the after treatment. Um, this print had darkened overall due to exposure to light. And you can see around the margins that they appear much lighter than the print area that would have been showing in the frame. And that's where the, the frame rabbit came over and protected the paper from exposure to light. We think a lot about um, light damage causing fading of materials, which it certainly does. Um, but with paper, what it often does is cause the paper itself to get, get darker. Um, and I won't get into the chemistry of that, but there's a lot of chemistry involved. Um, so this one has pretty pretty typical condition issues of a print that probably was on display for a considerable time um, based on how, how dark that paper is. Um, this one I, I, I picked kind of picked on it because you can see in the detailed image, there's a lot of areas that appear lighter and that is actually where silverfish um, which is the insect there on the on the left? Um, at some point, got into the frame. This one actually was, I think, missing missing its frame. Um, it might be that the insects got in there 
at that point after it was no longer in its frame and, and ate the top surface of the ink and the paper below. And again, sort of revealing that more original lighter tone of the paper. Um, do a little bit of carping on, on silverfish. Um, this is again, getting back to, you know, the importance of having a controlled environment for, for museum objects, especially paper. Um, silverfish really love to eat paper um, and they love dark, warm and humid environments. So, you know, we try our best to, to maintain conditions that they don't like um, and also do things like set insect traps to know when, when we do have them. Um, I'm not a person that usually kills insects, but if I see a silverfish, I, I kill it every, every time. You'll often see them in your books. Um, they're very creepy crawly and I, I, I do not have any love for them. Um, in terms of conservation treatment for this print, and actually all three of them, um, I chose to take a pretty conservative approach. Um, these three prints were all mounted to their original wooden strainers on the back. Um, the other Lancer prints that I've treated from the set were a type of print called a sheen collé, which means that the, the top layer of the print is actually a very, very thin paper that really takes the impression of the printing plate very well. Um, and that's mounted to a heavier weight paper. And sometimes there's an adhesive layer between those two papers. Sometimes it's really just the pressure of the plate um, when it's being printed and the papers are damp that are sort of melding those two paper layers together. Um, what, what can happen during wet treatment, whether there's adhesive or not, is that those, those two paper layers can start to bubble and separate. And they can be really difficult, if not impossible, to, to safely put back together again. Um, so these, these prints, you know, they've had, had some damage caused by exposure to light, but we know that they're going to be reframed um, in much more protected materials. The, the lighting in the parlors is, is very controlled. Um, so I felt like it wasn't worth the risk of having these papers separate. Um, to get to a point of treatment where we could really get them wet. So dry treatment of these, removing um, surface, surface dirt and soil using dry treatment methods. Um, these were also, you know, coming loose in some places from their strainers. Go again, going in with wheat starch paste and sticking all those paper layers back down. Um, and with this particular piece, we, you know, we really found that that damage caused by the silverfish was, was pretty visually distracting. Um, so this, this is a step that in conservation we call inpainting or compensation of loss. Um, and in this particular piece, case, I went in with watercolor and pastel pencils and sort of reintegrated that tone of the paper and put in a little bit of the line work as well. I think this is a really great example of like the, rea the reality of conservation. I think a lot of people have a common misconception that conservation treatment will take it back to its original, like if it was as if it were brand new. Um, so I think this is a really good example of like, that's, that's literally impossible, but like it is still an improvement and the object itself is more stable. Right, and, and for our collection, like these, these three prints, you know, two of them hang in the room together. The third one hangs, can you remind me where that one? In the North Parlor, so they're all near. They're all near each other, you know, so even if we could safely wet clean one, it, it would look so different than the other two. I mean, that's also part of the dialogue um, between the conservator and the museum staff is, you know, how are they all going to, where, where are they going to be displayed? What's their relation to each other? Um, that's all part of the conversation when we're developing a treatment plan for, for any object in a museum collection. So this is the challenge. I could also see why somebody might call this one Arctic Night. Um, so I'm curious to see if there, there was another print um, by that title at one point hanging in the homestead. Um, this one, similar condition issues. It had less silverfish damage, but it did have about a two inch long tear. And now the train is going by, so hopefully that's not, not too loud, the train whistle. Um, a two inch long tear in the upper right, um, probably caused by getting caught on a nail at some point would be my, my guess. Um, this one I think did have its original frame, but it was very badly damaged and at some point had been 
painted over with metallic radiator paint, which is something we see a lot um, with these 19th century frames. Somebody thinks it's gonna really make it look better and it, it really doesn't. Um, so showing here, this is showing the, the challenge um, after conservation, conservation treatment and reframing. Um, we worked with the local framer and the museum staff to come up with a historically appropriate reproduction frame. Um, we used all chemically inert materials to do the framing, the mat board, the paper behind it. And because these were open on the back originally, that's probably what caused that nail to make the puncture. And um, we did seal the back with a, a board so that in the future it couldn't catch on a nail. We, we treat a lot of these prints and photographs that have been mounted to strainers and are open on the back and they often people put their hands hands through them. So that's something else that we, if we do leave them on the strainer, we like to add a board to the back so that that can't, cannot happen again. And that's the lost sheep. Um, it was missing its frame when it came here. And again, we decided to come up with a reproduction frame that's similar to the one for the challenge, but not exactly the same because they probably would not have matched originally. Uh, so this next object is a um, framed photograph. It's about six inches tall. Uh, and it's a picture of Samuel Bowles, who was the editor of the Springfield Republican newspaper and a friend of Emily Dickinson. Um, this was previously on display in the poet's bedroom on her mantle. Um, and there's a sticker on the back of the frame in Mary Hampson's handwriting uh, that says picture of Samuel Bowles that once hung in Emily Dickinson's room in the homestead Amherst. So at least that gives us some information about it. Yeah, it's really important that uh, Mary Hampson has given this a, a, a location and her information, we believe, came uh, directly from Martha or from her uh, husband, Alfred, who um, had been an even closer associate of uh, Martha Dickinson Bianchi during, during his lifetime. And so what's really important about this is, of course, Samuel Bowles' connection to the Dickinson family, and especially to Austin, Susan, and Emily. Um, their relationships were warm and close and uh, ran, ran deep. Um, Emily wrote numerous letters and sent dozens of poems to Bowles, um, possibly because he was a publisher, but not, not necessarily entirely for that reason. Um, she kept track of his bouts of ill health uh, and was quite shaken by his kind of untimely death. Um, for his part, Bowles is, um, he's responsible for naming Emily the queen recluse, but kind of a, uh, an epithet uh, that in these last few years uh, speaks to kind of our own isolation and what we know of one of our connections with Emily Dickinson. Uh, he's also the one who said, uh, who, who upon being refused um, uh, by Emily that she would come down to meet him, shouted up the staircase, uh, you damn rascal, come down here. Um, some have pro proposed that the three draft letters to a master figure were intended for Samuel Bowles, um, and that's not, not necessarily proven. But without a doubt, uh, Emily and Sam had a unique relationship. So having this photograph and attribution turn up is both completely logical and, um, and truly intriguing. So Carolyn, can you tell us what, what to do about this? Yes, so um, this is, another one of these you know, sort of special case objects. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about how really, really all paper-based objects can be irreversibly damaged by exposure to light, you know, whether that be fading of the media or darkening of the paper. Some of those things are reversible when media fades and a photographic image fades. Um, in conservation, we, we don't, there's no way to bring it back without over painting it and that's really um, generally frowned upon in the field of, of paper conservation. Um, so we, we, you know, if, if we were treating a document and it had a faded signature, you know, we would never paint over top of it to make it look new. Um, so photographs, um, particularly 19th century photographs, 
really can be very sensitive to light. Um, you know, this particular photograph, I, I haven't had the opportunity to, to really look at it closely and take it out of the frame, but that would be sort of the next, next step for it. Um, but, you know, you can see in the photograph of the photograph that the image does appear faded um, and yellowed. And that's pretty typical um, condition that we see for, for 19th century photographs that have had a lot of light exposure. Um, this, one of the reasons I wanted to talk about this particular object is that, you know, sometimes we can really make the case, um, especially in historic house museums where parts of the collection might be on what we consider to be called, you know, permanent display because it's really important to the story um, that's being told in the house. And I think that's, this is one of those, one of those objects. Um, you know, you can make the case for taking the original photograph out of the frame, doing what conservation treatment we can to keep it stable and placing it in, in collection storage in the dark so that it really can't have the chance to change any further. Um, you know, the frame I'm sure is original to the piece. Um, and this is a good case for creating a, a digital reproduced print um, and putting it back in the original frame might, might be really the best, best option for this object. Um, I just included a few images on the right there of a photograph from a private collection, totally different time period, as you can tell. Um, but, you know, what can be done in terms of digital restoration um, and then making a new print to frame? Yeah, I think that's a really exciting option to explore for us. Uh, so these next pair of objects, they, these are two of four total doors, um, interior doors at the Evergreens that are uh, either in the nursery or near the nursery. And these four interior doors all have uh, images and cartoons pasted to the front of the door. Um, you can see the one on the left um, is kind of open and exposed to the room and the one on the right has a little bit of um, plexiglass. Um, tacked to it to keep um, very excited visitors from, from touching. Um, and one interesting uh, thing about these are, you know, we didn't catalog other doors in the houses, um, but during this project, these four doors, they, they tell a different story than all the other doors in the houses. Um, so these are, I think, some of our only architectural elements that we cataloged during this project. Yeah, I imagine these doors are, are going to be a big challenge. Uh, so I can't wait to hear what you're going to tell us about them, Carolyn. But um, so it, um, these images pretty much come from periodical children's periodicals um, published in the 1860s and 1870s. So to give you a sense of the relationship between the dates of publication and the and the three Dickinson children, and say Ned was born in 18. 61. Uh, Martha was born in 1866, and Gilbert was born in 1875. So within this dating, it seems likely that all three of the Dickinson children may have been involved in the selection and placement of these cutouts. But, you know, Gilbert, Gib, uh, being so much younger than Ned and Martha, um, his death in 1883 must certainly have brought this kind of um, architectural scrapbooking activity to an end. But um, how, how would you go about assessing and working with these materials, materials that seem in so much in conflict with each other? Yeah, so that's, that's a great question. Um, I've treated a number of of similar objects, different time periods, um, where you might have paper mounted to wood. Um, I did a project for a contemporary artist where he had mounted Polaroid photographs um, with something that really wasn't meant to be an adhesive to pine panels and painted over top of them. Um, and, and really, you know, as, as you can probably imagine, um, paper doesn't really like like wood and vice versa, they expand and contract at different rates. Um, you know, I think in this case, the paint on the doors, which is probably lead white, um, has, has provided some, some of a barrier layer 
from the the wood acids but you can see you know like the, the clippings are, are pretty dark and discolored and are acidic and they're quite brittle some of them um, have started to detach partly um, some of them have some gloss and some tears uh, but I, I just think that like, it's so incredible that they still exist I mean now that I've spent so much time in the evergreens it's not a surprise that they are still intact but I think they really are fascinating objects that tell a very specific story um, about this particular family um, so you know this is a case where, you know, I don't think an appropriate approach would be to take them all apart and put them in storage um, because they totally lose their context. So if you're, you're sort of flipping through um, an archival storage box and looking at these, you just you just don't get the same sense of, you know, what what these what these objects were and what they meant to the family and how they were used, you know, how how family members probably passed walking by how they felt when they passed walking by these doors after Gibbs' death. I mean, there's just like a lot of emotional content there. Um, it tells a story about probably their childhood relationships. It, it's, they're, they're, they're complex objects for, for lots of reasons. Um, so again, I haven't done any, any materials testing of these doors. You know, they probably used a... a one of the first things that I would want to do is to test test and see like how easily and safely could these pieces of paper be temporarily removed from the doors um, if that seemed appropriate and, and could be done without causing damage. And, you know, we might think about first documenting them very precisely, um, making a template, measuring everything out, taking really detailed photographs. Um, so that if, if they could be safely removed, um, we might take them off um, so that we could perform a series of wet treatments on the paper clippings themselves, um, because that's really the best way to remove the, the acids that have developed in the paper and help stabilize them for the future. Um, that would also allow us to place a barrier, barrier layer between the door and the, the sheets of paper themselves once they had been treated. Um, and that will prevent any acids from migrating through to, to the papers once they're re-adhered. Um, I've done some other really big projects for the Wall of Prayers, um, which were the construction panels that were set up outside of the world, outside of, outside of Bellevue Hospital after the World Trade Center bombing. And people posted all kinds of different papers for missing persons. And that, that was a, a similar project in some ways, because I had to come up with a way to document the exact location of the, the flyers, the tapes, everything, take it all apart, conserve it, and put it all back together. So again, it's totally different time period, but a similar type of object. Um, you know, it may be that testing shows that they're really well adhered to the wooden panels and that trying to, to take them off for wet treatment is too risky. Um, you know, we do a lot of weighing benefits and risks and figuring out, you know, what, what's, what's the best thing to do. Um, so it may be that we decide, nope, it's, it's going to cause too much damage to get them off, um, in which case we would treat them in place. Um, and again, we'd be limited to dry, dry cleaning treatments and then making sure that they really were firmly adhered in the areas where they were lifting because we don't want them to tear or flake off um, and incur any more loss. So either way, it's some, you know, you'll get to the point where they've either stayed on the board and have been conserved as best they can, or they've come off and gotten put back on. Um, and so the next thing to think about is, you know, how, how to protect them. You know, they're not a framed work of art that's being protected in the frame. Um, as Megan mentioned, you know, they're, they hang in a part of the house. Um, it's a pretty part of them are in a pretty narrow passageway, and it is hard not to bump into them. Um, it's tempting to, to touch them. Um, so, you know, taking all those factors in consideration and coming up with a way to, to protect them in, in place. And I think, you know, probably the most straightforward approach would be to get pieces of the UV filtering plexiglass cut and fastened to the doors in a way so the, the plexiglass isn't directly touching the paper, um, but you can do that because there's, they're adhered to the part of the door that's recessed. So I think that's 
that's sort of the less complicated piece of, of their preservation, um, sort of figuring out how much treatment can they can they sustain without getting damaged or or not is the is the big question for these. So our next object is a group of um, is a quilt block and some individual quilt squares um, that are attributed to the Dickinson family. Uh, you can see this is an unfinished quilt. It is in progress, uh, but left unfinished, uh, which is pretty exciting. Um, there are all different sorts of dress silks here, all different patterns and colors. Um, and you can see, especially on the, the black pieces, um, there's large white um, stitches. And that's because all of these dress silks are actually backed with pieces of paper um, because the silk itself is so kind of malleable that it would be hard to sew it together into this quilt block. Um, so that paper gives it some rigidity and makes it easier to work with. Um, and one really exciting aspect of um, these quilt squares is that we've actually been able to match a few of these um, pieces of fabric to collections that we have um, in storage here. So we have um, a bodice that's missing part of its sleeve and we've identified um, one of the fabrics that matches that blouse. Um, so that's really exciting. Um, so here is some of those paper backings. Um, we have all different types of um, handwriting and printing on each piece. There is pencil, there's purple ink, there's a wedding invitation that got cut up, there's math, there's grid paper, um, there's postage stamps. I mean, there's all sorts of odds and ends. Um, we've seen the name Dickinson several times. I believe Gib is written in here at least once. Um, so it's really exciting to think about where this paper originated and whose handwriting can we find? Could we eventually form full pieces of paper? Um, so this is a great example of something that we'll have to um, research in the future. Yeah, and, and from a conservation and preservation standpoint, the, the good news about these is I, I did look at these in storage a couple of weeks ago um, and a textile conservator did as well. And the the fabrics and the paper backers really are in very stable condition. Um, again, you know they they didn't get used, they didn't get worn for for whatever reason. Um, you know somebody put a lot of there's there's a lot of them. This is just a very small sampling. Um, they didn't get finished and they got put in a box and that 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 was that. Um, so in terms of conservation treatment, I I really didn't see anything to to my mind that begged for, for active treatment to the objects. Um, but really the question for these in my mind is, you know, how, how best to, to store them? Um, you know, these probably are not objects that are just gonna be put in a box tomorrow and put to bed. Um, you know, so coming up with a way that allows them to be safely handled, um, allows them to be possibly exhibited, and you know, and the other the other kind of fun thing to think about, um, and this would draw in other other types of experts is you know how how can we get to the text on these objects? Um, you know, this is not really something that I would especially advocate for taking them all apart and looking at the the text and putting it all back together. Um, that's a lot of work and very complicated. I, I do think there's possibly um, some ways to image them. Um, and capture a lot of that information and then have a really fun project of trying to puzzle things back together. So I think these are, are really exciting um, from a context point of view. Um, and it's it's lucky that they're in such good condition. Yeah, it just they're so complicated because textiles are so sensitive and paper is so sensitive and and we're really lucky, lucky that they're in stable condition right now. We just want to make sure they, they stay that way. That's our, that's our <laughs> absolutely. Um, so our final image that we're going to talk about tonight, um, we found as the the picture on the left, which is a simple looking journal. Uh, but when we opened it up, uh, we found that um, it's all lined paper, mostly empty. But the first few pages are filled with handwriting of Susan Dickinson. And we think that it's some type of uh, baby book for uh, her youngest child, Gib, who we talked about earlier. 
Um, so she writes for several pages about his birth and early life. And then later on, she uh, pasted in a note that he sent her and then she wrote an explanation. And further in the pages, there was some, some loose other 2D objects, other letters that Gibb had written. Um, so it appears to all be uh, directly related to Gibb, which is you know, very exciting to have both Susan's handwriting in the collection and objects related to Gibb. Um, but like most, most things associated with Gibb in the nursery, um, there's you know, some emotional heaviness there since Gibb contracted typhoid fever in 1883 and died when he was only eight years old. Um, so with that context, this, this book of Susan's memories of her last child really feels very significant. Yeah, there, there's something just so really affecting and poignant about this journal. Um, Gibb uh, was Austin and Susan's third child, born when both were in their mid 40s. Um, and he was just this combination of impish and charming. Um, he was well known and well loved throughout the town. Uh, and his early death was devastating to the entire family. So Austin and Susan, they both kind of retreated into their own private grief. Um, and not long after, Austin jumped headfirst into a long running affair with Mabel Todd. And uh, Gibbs siblings, Martha and Ned were, they were bewildered and confused and hurt and angry uh, by all of this <clears throat> maelstrom of events. Uh, and um, for the most part, kind of rallied around their mother, but certainly came to terms with their, with their father's uh, uh, behavior. Um, Emily herself became ill on the night of Gibbs' death and never fully recovered her own health. And it was just uh, a couple of years later that she herself died. So it's, it's a little hard to know how to read this document. You know, was it written in real time while um, Gibb was, uh, was growing up and um, do, doing different things as little boys would do and Susan was recording it? Um, was it full of hope, sort of recording the, the dazzling charms of this sweet little boy? Or was it written in retrospect to preserve memories of a life cut short? Um, in either case, conservation of this unique item is, is an important priority because it, is, um, it just exudes the, the sort of heights and depths of um, family experience. Um, so this kind of manuscript book, Carolyn, uh, what, kind of, what kind of issues does it bring up for you? So, you know, scrap, scrapbooks, whether they be, you know, this type of journal where most of the entries are written on the actual pages of the journal itself with some pasted in editions and loose pages or a scrapbook that contains hundreds of newspaper clippings or World War II letters and envelopes um, that have been put into a family album or photographic albums. Um, they, they also can be very challenging to work on as a conservator. Um, because oftentimes the materials are, are mixed. They're not the same weight of paper. They're not the same type of material. Um, oftentimes the adhesives that were used might be failing or causing damage. Um, and, and this is actually one of the things that when I was in graduate school 20 years ago and more, um, I did a research dissertation on sort of look, how, how do we as conservators, you know, take into consideration the, the context and the original use of objects such as scrapbooks. Um, you know, there's been some projects that I've done where the best just treatment approach was to document everything, photograph every page, um, capture all the layout and the inscriptions and, to, and take it apart um, and, and rehouse it as individual objects. Um, I did that with a photographic album from the 1940s and the the paper that the book was made of was just so brittle and falling apart and the photographs were printed on very heavy paper and there, there was no safe way for them to stay together um they were so broken up so you know we, we digitized everything before we took it apart um, we kept all the inscriptions and returned them in archival housings and and that that was how it ended for that particular project um, this this 
Sue's Sue's book, um, you know, it, again, it's in it's in fairly good condition. Um, you know, it does have what I'm pretty sure is probably hide glue adhesive. You can see um, it's starting to to turn brown and has a a shiny gloss to it. And those are both properties that suggest that it's a hide glue. Um, you know, if it was really brittle and not holding the papers together anymore, I would probably make a stronger case for taking it apart and putting it back together. Um, but I think, you know, given what the condition is and also why and how this was made, um, you know, my inclination is to do some some surface cleaning and, you know, repair any tears, um, possibly try to figure out where that loose page came from, if it came from this particular book and getting it back into its correct location. Um, I know there's some other loose loose items. Um, you know, really, really doing doing less, I think, where this object is doing more um, in terms of preserving its its historical integrity. Um, but there, it's it's different every time. You know, that's the thing that makes conservation so fun is there is not there is not a playbook where it's like, and this was what we do to scrapbooks. Um, it's really it really comes down to very individual assessments and looking at the materials and the context and use. Um, so my job is always pretty pretty interesting. It's always different. Well. Thank you so much, Carolyn, for all of your insights tonight and across the entire um, length of this project. I have learned so much. Even tonight, I learned something new. Um, and yeah, your help in this project has been just so immense. And I can't thank you enough for everything. Well, it's been incredibly fun. It's been, it's been my my pleasure to be part of this, this project. So it's really great. Thank you. Um, so we do have a special. Um, uh, a special guest who's going to join us tonight. Um, I'm sure many of you are really interested to learn more about um, all of our objects, but especially this journal um, that contains um, some of Sue's, you know, internal thoughts. Um, so we have Deb Polanski who's going to join us. Deb is a passionate reader of Emily Dickinson and a longtime friend of the museum, and she actually helped to uh, transcribe Sue's journal for us. Uh, it's about seven pages. Um, and it is, it's really an incredible feat to have um, this work done. So thank you, Deb. Oh, thank you so much, Megan, and everybody for at the museum for giving me the opportunity to work on the, um, on the journal and to have a chance to share what I found. Um, while I was spending time with this artifact, which was really just copies of the pages, Megan sent me the copies so I could try to decipher the handwriting and I blew them up. Well, not like that, but I, you know, made them larger so that I could trace them and try to speak, speak what I could out loud um, to try to understand the handwriting. Um, made me think a lot about the word text and um, I guess in medieval Latin word textus is where that word comes from. And that literally means a thing that is woven. And I thought a lot about that because I felt like, like a textile or like texture. I felt as if uh, Sue was kind of weaving together these strands of memory that she had for, for Gib um, and creating this text, which you know we then use to understand Sue a little bit more. Um, and like Emily Dickinson's poems that talk about seemingly ordinary things like the bee, the butterfly, the breeze, Sue is talking about these very seemingly ordinary moments in a child's life. But at the end of the day, it's really what makes up the extraordinary feelings and memories that she has of this child, who her golden child who died at age eight. Um, and she creates not only a portrait of Gibb, but when we read it, we get a portrait of Sue in the context of history and of her life, you know, at that time of, of writing. It is my belief after spending some time with the journal that she was writing this after he died. I, it's, this is still like, as Jane said, it is still a mystery, but there were a couple of things that clued me into believing that this was something that she pulled together these threads in an attempt to sort of hold him still after he had died. You'll hear when I read what I found, uh, and maybe you can see if you agree with me. 
Time is very nonlinear in this journal. She jumps around just as we do in our own memory. I think when we remember things, time is not linear. Um, but reading it really ignited my imagination and curiosity about life in the evergreens and it made it feel very close uh, to me. It made me feel like I could just imagine it so much more. And I think that is the magic and what's really thrilling about the collections and all of these pieces, which, um, you know, through the process of looking at them, we come to understand the individual lives more, as well as the, you know, certainly the objects, but maybe that we understand a little bit more about ourselves when we, when we are looking at these objects um, and really getting to see, you know, what stories get told by the things we leave behind. So I found that really fascinating when I was looking through this journal. Um, like all things Dickinson, it remains shrouded in mystery. There are missing words, words I simply could not transcribe. It was too elusive. And I know, um, Megan, you are putting these objects eventually on the, on a website so that other people will get a chance to look and see and maybe try to help solve the mystery of these missing words. So just as Jane said, this does feel like a very poignant object. Um, I want to acknowledge that we're reading something really personal of someone that I really felt that while I was transcribing the journal, it felt very intimate and I felt a real sense of reverence for Sue and her feelings and her thoughts while I transcribed this. So, um, Anyway, I invite you all to listen and see what you think. Okay, we'll start from the beginning. Lest our uncertain memory fail to record the clear and bright little sayings and ways of our last baby, after repeated resolves and daily puttings off, I'm fairly started in a journal of his little life, although more than four years have borne him on with tender tide. Thus far, his life seems more like the growth of a gay wildflower and a breezy upland, drinking in sunshine and season's heat with every moment, rather than the beginning of a long and dusty journey with an end surpassing all imagination in its fascinating mystery and tragedy. How well my mother's heart remembers the day he came, a Sunday morn, the first day of August, a cool, clear, magnificent morning, just the day in which to be born. At noon, the choir of the village church was singing the missionary chant, and I could hear the rich, full notes as they were borne in on the sweet summer air through the open doors and windows. And the chatting of the sweetsers, our neighbors, as they passed up our driveway with their grandchildren returning from service. In half an hour, there was a new baby in the house, and everybody fairly cried for joy as the new pair of little lungs gave forth such a robust wail that the old nurse exclaimed, no fear of consumption here. And so the baby came, very plump, weighing his more than 10 pounds, not blushing as deeply, as deeply, she says twice, as our want for the follies he is evermore to commit. He was red because he was just born, not because he was embarrassed for doing something bad. He was very vigorous, nearly throwing himself off the nurse's legs when his first toilet was made by the kitchen fire where he was born to prevent any chill from the new air of this very new world. Unbiased women called him very plump, white and pretty. And so he grew like any other little animal looking very cherubic when he was asleep under a curtain of pink lace in the big armchair where Ned and Maddie took their mysterious sleeps till they were two months old, but very unlike an angel when awake and crying as he did for some unexplainable cause till he was three months old. In the meantime, he showed great strength of will and muscle insisting on looking at the light wherever he could find it. And at three weeks old, as he lay on my shoulder in the hall, I remember how he would throw his head back to gaze at the hall lamp above us till it seemed as if his little neck would snap. He had a cozy winter in the nursery with his old nurse, Mrs. Purrington of Pelham, a something, that's the mystery word, pure Yankee who nursed him faithfully though with a something, something, unable to ward off a long attack of pneumonia when he was eight months old. But thank God he came out of it clear and fresh and he was carried into the open air with the first 
garden something. I remember on the 4th of July of that year, he was in my care in the nurse's absence. And as he sat on the bottom stair in the hall, he kept time perfectly as I sang Yankee Doodle. From that time, he developed a growing love of music and idea of time till the present writing when he is past six. In March of his second year, he was baptized in our parlor at home by Mr. Jenkins, who on that Sunday preached his familiar sermon to his people. There were lovely friends and flowers and the name Thomas Gilbert Dickinson was given him for my brother and father. And for two years, we called him Tomasi, given by my family name of Gilbert. His Dickinson will was firmly shown when he was two and toddling in the grass. And I suggested he do something. He patted off, shrugging his little shoulders and saying, no, no, do mama too. And that's where it ends. Except there's one page where she glues in a little note. It says written by Gilbert one rainy March day from the office where he stopped with his father when he was six years old. She and Gilbert writes, dear mama, I don't want to come down in the rain this noon. Please send Papa's and my dinner up. Send all you can. And that's 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 the end of what we have. I know there are a few more things in the back of the journal, but that's what I saw. And it just felt like such a little slice of life to me. Yeah, it's such a snapshot of this, you know, such an intimate relationship between a young child and the mother remembering all of these things. And you're right, she jumps around all the time. It's just, you know, when the memory sparked her, she wanted to jot it down. And right. it's really fascinating to think about the context of her writing this. Yeah, I mean, I, I when I read the part that said, um, with an end surpassing all imagination in its fascinating mystery and tragedy, that's when I was like, oh, maybe he has he has died and she's doing whatever she can to try to sort of rein in whatever memories that she can capture and put on the page. Um, but who knows? We, I, that's my guess though. Um, it's a little bit hard to tell. And there, there is a point where the pen changes, the ink changes. Mm. Um, that's like towards the end. So it's, yeah, it's unclear. Did she write it all in one fell swoop and then changed later or yeah, how, how that worked. Mm. I imagined her coming back to it um, maybe more than once and just sort of trying to get it down. I mean, I, I, I think it's interesting sort of as a, anyone who's got children might might relate to the fact that you, you, you know, in the beginning you take pictures, you, you, you have this idea that you're gonna organize things and write it in a journal about things and have photos. And I mean, I personally didn't get to putting pictures of my kids in a photo album until they were eight. And so there is a part of me thought, maybe she's just writing this after he's older, but there were just a couple of things that really made me feel like it was her attempt to hold on to him after he had died. Um, but I don't know, it's hard to know. I think that that not knowing is an example of um, why this work, why this whole collections project has been, documentation project has been so important for us. Um, we um, are trying to uh, make inroads into, into not knowing, um, mm -hmm. to uh, more fully identify what we, what we have so that we can make better use of it, but also so we can make, we can bring what knowledge we can from those objects. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's, it's been very, very exciting and is only going to get more so now that um, the collections are identified and we can begin to work through them uh, to, uh, to extract things as um, sort of emotionally affecting as, as this journal. Mm -hmm. um, Megan, I'm wondering if you have any couple of thoughts about next, next steps and actions yet to come. Um, I mean, as we've seen today, just, you know, just this one object turned out to be, you know, a, a very deep look into the life of Sue and Gibb, um, just with a little bit of, of time and effort to, to figure it out. Um, and so that, 
I mean, that's definitely the future of collect the collections work at the museum is to, to research more of our objects on this level. Um, we also have a lot of, you know, old documentation. Like I mentioned, Sue did an inventory of the Evergreens in 1895. So matching her inventory with our objects and seeing where they might have been in the Evergreens back in 1895, that's an exciting project. Um, so there's, there's just a lot to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Deb, thank you so much. I know that was uh, that that was both pra in a practical sense incredible because of Sue's particular handwriting, right? But <laughs> but also uh, incredibly rich in in um, what you found in that journal. Well, it really was a thrill for me to work on it, and I there were times I felt like I had goosebumps, you know, reading it. It really felt like. Um, just a really powerful uh, opportunity to feel like get like I got a real glimpse of something that um, I was curious about. So I'm very, very grateful for the opportunity. Well, thank you. And thank you, Carolyn. And please uh, stay stay around, Carolyn and Megan, because we have a few questions uh, for you. And let me um, take a moment to encourage um, all of our uh, uh, viewers to uh, put your questions in the chat. I, I mean, I'm sorry, put your questions in Q&A. Um, I see a few questions running past in the chat and we will get to um, some of those. Uh, but I'd like first to direct a question to you, Carolyn. Um, here's one about um, kind of the purpose of conservation uh, of the objects you work with. Is it uh, is conservation visual only, or is the functionality of the object restored? That is, what do we do with something like the bandbox? Where um, would you seal it shut, or do we get to take the lid off and on? Or... Yeah, that's, a, that's a great question. I think you know when I think about what is my goal in conservation treatment, you know, it varies from object to object, um, but really it's preserving and retaining all the original materials as best I can. Um, so really focusing on structural stabilization, um, removing components that could cause the paper or other materials to break down over time. Um, you know, and depending on the type of collection and object and its original intended use, its new new life, um, you know, looking at aesthetic considerations, that's oftentimes secondary. I mean, especially with um, archives collections, you know, we very rarely perform um, aesthetic treatments like stain reducing treatment on documents and letters. Um, that tends to fall more into the realm of fine, fine art treatments. Um, but just a little insight, and when we when we do our treatment proposals at my studio, um, even if we're working on a work of art that has severe staining, um, we always break that treatment step out as a separate individual step and consult with the client when it's time to get to that point and determine, you know, we, we don't want to make a judgment call. Um, does this look like you want it to look? Um, it, it's really a, an ongoing dialogue, um, you know, and we certainly never... I think as Megan mentioned, like we're not really trying to get things back to looking new. Um, we're trying to to stabilize them and get them to a point where they their visual integrity is 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 I hate to use the word restored, um, but comes back. Uh, you know, we're not trying to get things to bright white. They probably never were bright white. Um, you know, and and staining and discoloration is part of the history of the of the object. So I think that's one of the in conservation, we sort of talk a lot about what's the difference between conservation and restoration. Um, and restoration tends to be more focused on the visual impact of, of what you do to it. And that's really a secondary consideration um, in most of the treatments that we do. Well, thank you. And then, um, Megan, here's a question, uh, to, uh, a question asked in slightly different ways twice, and that is, do restorers ever make facsimiles of objects like the scroll for display or research? And I'm considering that kind of a collections manager question. Um, or I'll put it put another way, uh, does it make sense to make reproductions um, that can be handled? or opened or closed, or if it's not reproductions, what are the options? 
Um, so actually we've we've kind of done that with our recent restoration. Um, we received a large gift from the Apple TV show Dickinson that had uh, pieces that were from the mid 19th century from New England um, that they used on the set of their show. And so they weren't Dickinson, original Dickinson family pieces, but they were of the era of the place. Um, and we've used some of those on display um, and eventually we'll also use them as part of an education collection. So they don't have that original context of being Dickinson pieces, but they are very closely related. They're matches of some of our objects specifically. Um, and so there's a way that I think we can use um, you know, pairs of our objects um, in different ways that aren't harming the original object itself. Yeah, and sometimes we also like to, um, sometimes museums have um, study collections or education collections, and collection might not be quite the right word in that case, but these are, these are objects um, intended for handling and even consumption. And by consumption, I mean um, wearing out or destruction. So, so, that, um, so that learners, and, uh, and sometimes especially younger learners, can get a sort of a tactile sense of um, how an object functions or what the, what the characteristics of the object are. So they are in, completely intended to be, be hands-on. Um, let's see, um, another question about the complexities of paper-based materials. In your um, explanations, Carolyn, um, it, 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 you described um, quite a range of different circumstances and ways to treat objects. And um, is this, from your perspective, is this true of all conservation specialties? Hey, I, I think I think it really applies across across the board. Um, you know, we're all often working on objects that involve different materials, whether it's an oil painting on canvas, um, you've got the paint layers, you might have the gesso, you might, you've got the canvas itself, you might have a varnish, you might have a wooden strainer. Um, it, it's very rarely just, I can't think of like, let's think of this true, any object that I treated where it was just one material. I mean, I think the way that these, things are made is com is complex. Um, so I think it does, it, I don't I don't think it's particular to, to paper conservation. I think it's really across the board, you know, the complexity of things that people make. Um, never, never straightforward in one material. And now we have a question that um, I think both of you have encountered a situation like this over and over again. Um, in, certainly with this documentation project as you've made your way through an entire collection. Um, as you go through your collection, do you set aside items that are most important and need conservation, uh, sort of a triage? Um, and is the expense of uh, conservation also a consideration in, I suppose, in what you prioritize for conservation? Yeah, so one of the best things that we did as part of this project was to bring on three conservators that specialize in different areas so that while we were going through the objects, we could flag certain records to pull out when the conservators came that, you know, this is in really poor condition. We're not really sure what to do with it. This is falling apart. Is this a disaster? Or this is, seems stable to me, but you're the expert. What do you think? Um, so I, that was a huge benefit of this project was that we got to, to speak to different conservators um, about those things. Um, and, you know, we don't, we don't know what's necessarily important in our collection. All of our, all of our collections are important. Um, but that, you know, the expense is always going to be a consideration is if something is going to cost, you know, an exorbitant amount of money. Is that worth it to treat one object versus can we better the collection as a whole in a different way through rehousing or, you know, buying dehumidifiers or something like that? So um, I think that's always kind of a balance. Yeah, and I also am going to say that's that's totally my perspective as a conservator too. Um, you know, a possible next step for parts of this collection um, at some point would be to have different conservators come in and do what's called a, a condition survey of the collection, um, where we might look at, 
you know, one grouping of, you know, all the pastels or all the photographs and write up more detailed condition reports for each object that would go along with those records that just all got finished being done today. Um, and then when, when I do those projects, I often do come up with a scheme for priority for treatment. Um, and that's based on how I look at it as a conservator. Um, and then the museum staff has to take what, what I say in terms of what condition risks are um, and weigh that out against what's the significance of the object. Um, you know, as Megan said, is it worth, you know, if there's one really important object that needs a lot of conservation treatment, do you decide to allocate your budget to that or do you spread that money across a greater number of objects? I mean, I I have the, the good fortune of not having to make those budgetary decisions, um, but I'm very sympathetic to, you know, what what is appropriate for guiding museums on how to take care of their collections. It's really not all about treating every single thing. I mean, everybody has a budget. So it's it's these these survey projects really help um, all of us understand the collections as a whole. And then the next step is to start looking at things more individually and then coming up with a, a plan for those yeah. objects. Which I'm looking forward to because apparently we have no lack of opportunity to uh, to make these choices about what's important to conserve. Um, now that we now that we know our full collection, um, I think we'll be faced with this uh, continuously. So perhaps we can end on a question <clears throat> um, that may appropriately have uh, too many shades of answer. And that is about the relationship of Mabel Loomis Todd and Emily Dickinson. Were they really friends? Um, certainly Mabel Todd thought so. Um, however, Emily, uh, Emily never actually saw her, she never saw Emily face to face until, until after Emily's death. And it seemed that Emily was controlling that um, pretty carefully. Um, so, um, but the, there, there can, as I mentioned, there can be shades of, of meaning within that and around that. <clears throat> so um, I want to thank you very much, Carolyn and Megan and Deb and Caitlin uh, for all of your wonderful contributions to this evening's program. Um, it's been just a fantastic uh, opportunity to look behind the scenes um, with you at this wonderful emerging collection. Um, and I want to thank all of you who have joined us online. And I hope you've seen and heard something intriguing tonight and that you'll plan a visit to see more in person at the Emily Dickinson Museum. Uh, as I mentioned, this has been the second in a series of these behind the scenes programs exploring the museum's collection <clears throat> and our work in cataloging it for the first time. So I hope you'll stay tuned for part three, coming to your computer screens later in the summer. Uh, news of the exact time and date uh, will be coming along with um, uh, an announcement of who our special guest will be and a few objects specifically associated with Emily Dickinson herself and hidden away for decades. So this is going to be kind of thrilling. Um, and at that time, we'll bring you news about how to access our collections database, which is going live in, um, we'll call it September. Um, it's, again, that's going to be a thrill to have um, access to information and images of all these, all these wonderful objects. So one more note, join us again on Thursday, July 20th for this month's Phosphorescence Poetry Reading, um, which will feature poets Rebecca Pelkey, Elizabeth White, and, Car and Carolina Hachandani. Uh, to learn more about the museum and our programs or to make a donation that helps support programs like this one, visit us at emilydickinsonmuseum.org. Thanks to all of you. And we wish you a very good and cool night. <laughs>